All right, and now we are live. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to another another Dental Shadowers virtual shadowing session. Um, today we have Dr. Haylot, a general dentist. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today. And whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, I want to give you a little bit of background about myself and how I got here. But then I have a lot of cases for you guys to see at the end because I feel like you'd be more interested in seeing pictures of teeth than anything else. So here we go. My name is Dr. Halot. I practice in Houston, Texas in the medical center. And I've been practicing in Houston since 2014. I went to dental school in, the, um, in Georgia. It used to be called Medical College of Georgia. Since then, they've changed the name multiple times. I don't even know what it's called right now. But it's well, Dental College of Georgia, let's say. Okay, so I moved to the U.S. when I was 17 from Jordan, and I was the person who grew up saying they want to be a dentist when they grow up. I don't know why. I think my mother brainwashed me when I was little or something. Um, when I moved here, I had no idea that it was going to be like four years of undergrad and then four years of dental school. I thought it was like back home, you go to dental school straight away. So when I came here, I was like, I don't want to waste eight years. And I remember my dad handing me like a paper that had all the majors listed on it. And I looked at them and I was like, OK, political science sounds interesting, but no, I guess I'm just going to stick to what I want. So I had to learn through the process. Um, I knew that I had to keep my GPA up and I really didn't know how competitive it is or what exactly the process involves. So Again, I had to learn um, while I was in college. So I, um, I was a biology major. I attended um, University of South Carolina from 2005 to 2009. Then I, did, I had a year gap, and then I did dental school from 2010 to 2014. And then I moved from Georgia to Houston in 2014, and I've been practicing since. Okay, so advice for college. Um, you want to make sure that you have a high GPA. So I, um, you know, I had A's in most of my classes. I graduated with a 3.8. Um, but let me tell you, I mean, it's not easy to get A's in, all, in most of your classes. I had, remember, I, my English was pretty good, but I didn't know how to write essays and papers. And I think I got to be in my English class. So um, if you are thinking of going to professional school, make sure your professors know that. Because I remember in socio sociology class or something, I was going to get a lower grade. And I went and talked to her. And I was like, listen, I really want to apply to dental school. What can I do to increase my grade? And I remember she gave me an assignment or something just to, and I ended up getting an A in the class. I'm sure your professors know that, and I know they will work with you because that happened to me. Um, and then you want to work or shadow at, at a dental office. I shadowed our uh, family dentist. And then after a couple of sessions there, they asked me if I wanted to work there. And I was so excited. So um, I just cleaned stuff. I did sterilization, uh, did like room turnovers. And um, he even would ask me to assist him sometimes. So that was very exciting. And I remember the first time he asked me to assist him, it was like a full mouth extraction. So he wanted to see if I would pass out or not. Thankfully, I didn't. But um that was fun. Uh, but I gained a lot of experience from there, whether it was answering phone or knowing how to talk to patients. And um, because a big part of our job is communicating and knowing how to talk to patients and explaining to them procedures and stuff. Um, prepare for your DAT. The way I did the DAT is, um, if I remember correctly, I studied the Kaplan book and for the PET, PAT part, I um, did the crack, the PAT. It's like a software that had a bunch of questions, um, but that was it. I took my DAT three times. Um, my grade didn't really change that much. Um, and my DAT score was pretty average. I think it was like a 19 or something. So it wasn't that amazing. The first year I applied, I got waitlisted. 
Um, so to better my chances of getting in, I did research with a professor in the actual dental school. I lived like 30 minutes away. So I asked if I could do research. Obviously, I wasn't paid for it, but it was really good to get my foot in the door, get to meet people there. And um, it was good to get like a letter of recommendation from him. Um, and he ended up teaching me histology in dental school. So uh, I think that's um, that's a, something that you can do to um, better your application process. Oh, enjoy your summer breaks. You will never have like three month breaks ever again. So enjoy your summer breaks. Okay, advice for dental school, and this is in general. I don't know how many dental students there are, but remember this advice for when you're in dental school. Okay, you're in dental school to learn. Don't try to impress anyone. Don't think, oh, now the professors are gonna think I'm stupid or whatever. You are there to learn. Try to ask as many questions as you can. Try to learn how to manage complications. Nobody's gonna give you this information when you're out of dental school. Um, and you'll probably be more embarrassed to ask when you're a dentist than when you're a dental student. So um, learn, you know, ask all the questions you have, uh, play scenarios in your head, tell them, okay, what if the patient tells me this? How do I say this? From the simplest thing to the most complicated things, learn. You are there to learn. Don't worry that they're judging you or they're not going to give you a good grade because at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. People... Um, my friends in dental school who used to get C's are now one of the most uh, successful people practicing, you know, so I mean, do well in dental school, but grades are not everything. You're really there to learn. You're going to be doing a lot of lab work. You're going to hate it at the time because you would spend so many, so much time practicing and in the lab and doing lab work. And we used to think like, I'm never going to do lab work when I'm a real dentist. Why should I do it now? It's because you need to learn how to communicate with the lab. You need to learn what the lab does so that you can give them what they need to give you the product that you are looking for. Um, also, be smart with your loan money. So um, some of us are really lucky and their parents pay for their tuition in dental school. I wasn't one of those people. I had to take a loan. Um, but I tried to be smart with my loan money. So whatever I didn't need at the end of that semester, I would return. That way I wouldn't be paying um, interest on. And then when I finished dental school, my goal was to focus like and pay off my student loan. And I did. I paid off my student loan after like a year, two years, maybe a year and a half to two years after dental school. Um, but like every bonus, and it hurt, it, it really hurt. But every bonus I got, it went straight to um, my student loans because they're like, they have an interest rate of six points something, which is huge. Um, so you don't want that to be accumulating. And I remember some, when I was in y'all's shoes, some dentists came and talked to us when we were students and told us, you know, at the beginning, you want to live like a student. And I did. Uh, my husband was a resident at the time. Um, our income wasn't that high, but we lived within our means and I made sure that I pay off my loans. So now I'm in dentistry because I like it, not because I have a financial obligation that I have to pay it off. Okay, advice for job applications. This is probably like years from now, um, but part, this was part of my journey. When I graduated dental school, I said I went to school in Georgia and then we had to move to Houston because my husband did his fellowship here and eventually we decided to stay in Houston but it was really hard at the beginning because I didn't know anybody in Houston I didn't know any dentists I had no connections whatsoever um, and I was applying for jobs while I was still in dental school so I had to come visit uh, during spring break and I did job interviews during that time um, I did take three months off after I graduated. We went on a long vacation, came back, and really nobody wanted to hire a new grad that had no connections. I didn't know anyone. So I interviewed in so many different places. I ended up, um, and this job where I'm at right now was my very first job interview ever. 
Um, and at the time they weren't looking for anyone, but I had sent my CV to them because I really liked their office. And I was like, hmm, I really want to work there. <laughs> so I sent off, I sent them my CV without them even having like a posting or anything. And they contacted me and they're like, we'd really like to meet you. Um, so I interviewed here and I met them. And then um, at the time they had no need. They already had like three doctors. I went and worked somewhere else. And then I was like, well, let me stay in touch. So I emailed them and they're like, oh, one of our doctors is leaving. So why don't you come back? So that kind of how it played out. The, the reason I'm saying this story is that you don't wait. You don't want to wait until if there's like a place that you're dreaming of or whatever, don't wait for them to reach out. Keep reaching out. Try to make connections. Um, talk to people and you never know. So I worked in a different office for about three months. I was not happy there. It was not what I thought dentistry was. And I just, I didn't like it at all. Um, and the reason, again, I'm saying this is because each cult, like office culture is different. So that's something that you want to look for. Um, and when we say like, like a practice philosophy, there really is a philosophy. There are some things that I refuse to do um, that other people could be willing to do. So you really want to work with people who align with you in terms of ethics, in terms of skills, in terms of what you see yourself doing on the long run. Um, so if you're not happy in a place, don't stay there. Just leave and look for something else. Okay. What kind of complaints do patients present with? Obviously, toothaches. Um, broken teeth. <laughs> we see a lot of broken teeth. Um, something stuck in my gums. One time I pulled out a dog hair out of somebody's gum, like that was stuck in there. That was pretty interesting. Uh, jaw pain, especially now, everybody's stressed out. Everybody's clinching and grinding their teeth. So we see a lot of that. Um, I do Botox injections for the masseter muscles. So I've been doing a lot of that. I've been doing a lot of night guards. That goes along with the facial muscle ache. Um, I don't like my smile. So I do a lot of smile makeovers and veneers. And um, I've had a patient tell me their teeth is the color of corn. So we did whitening on him. Okay, so the procedures I perform. And really when you're a general dentist, you learn the basics, right? So you learn um, the fillings, the crown, okay, a crown here, a crown there. Doing big cases is really complex. You need extra training in that. So I did have to take a bunch of CE courses. Um, one of the guys who works with me, um, I view him as my mentor because he taught me so much. So it's really nice to work with someone um, who has more experience than you do or have been working longer because you get to learn from their mistakes. You don't have to make the same mistake that they did. Um, so they'll teach you that. And um, and it's nice to work with someone because you can kind of like show each other, like, what do you think I should do here? What do you, you know, it's, it's um, it, it is what I was looking for. That's what I was looking for. I was looking to join someone who I could learn from. Okay, so I do a lot of smile makeovers, full mouth rehabilitation, and that's for people who, um, and I'll show you a case of that, um, neglected their teeth for so long. So they ground off their teeth, they have tiny little teeth um, that you want to build back up. And these are complex cases. They cost a lot of money, time, effort, thinking, everything. Crown and bridge, that's kind of like the bread and butter of dentistry. Inlays and onlays, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but they're like uh, gold or porcelain fillings, basically. It's like a puzzle piece that fits into the void. We talked about the fillings. I do Invisalign. Uh, we use the iTero scanner to scan patients. And what's nice about the scanner, it's 3D, so the patient can really see their teeth in like full view because usually they're not aware of um, how bad their teeth might be. And there's a simulation on it. So it shows them if they did Invisalign, how would it look like? Um, we do extractions, root canals. I think with root canals, you either love it or hate it. There's no middle ground. <laughs> I hate it. So I'll do, I don't do a lot of root canals. Uh, I refer most of them out, but it is important to know how to do them obviously, because I mean, I had to do one this week because the patient was still in the chair and everything was open. And I was like, let's just go ahead and do it. 
Um, and I already talked about Botox for masseter muscles. So that's more like therapeutic, not, I did take a Botox and fillers class from the, um, what is it called? American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. I didn't feel comfortable doing fillers. I just don't think that should be part of our job as dentists. And I just don't do that part, but the Botox, I definitely see the use for it. Okay, some pictures. Oh man, I was supposed to hide that picture on the right. But anyway, a patient presented, um, that was her birthday. And she was like, oh, I feel like I have a little bit of pain. I'm not sure what's going on. So I look at the tooth, you see the picture on the left. It looks fine, right? And then I, as soon as I touched it, I found out that it was split in half. Um, you'll be surprised to find out that that patient left that day like that. She didn't want to do anything. So it happens. So we see a lot of fractured and broken teeth. Let me see if this one's going to work. Okay. And then we do fillings. So I have a patient who has these black um, cavities. When he smiles, it shows. And that's with a simple filling, you know, nothing. And, and this is a very simple procedure, but it has a huge, like he was so happy when we did this. He was ecstatic that he doesn't have these black holes anymore. Okay, this is a case that I did in dental school. And when I say learn when you're in dental school, this is what I mean. This was a case we were, well, they gave people the option. Like if you want to do a cosmetic case, you have to team up with a resident, okay? And that means you have to like, align my schedule with the patient's schedule, with the resident's schedule. So it was a lot of work, a lot, a lot of work, but I learned so much. I wouldn't have the confidence that I had coming out of dental school had I not done this case. And also what's nice about dental school is that you have all the departments around you. So you can walk over to oral surgery and have them help you with a case or walk to the periodontist who, um, so the a periodontist helped us with her um, gum levels. So you can see how, let's split the mouth in half. We usually want it to be symmetric. The right is symmetric to the left. So if you take a look, you'll see her gum levels here are higher than here. Okay, you see that here, the gum levels are really low. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, okay. The gum levels here are really low here. They're high and it's just all over the place. She obviously has the space that she wanted to close. So we did a um, crown lengthening procedure. And what that basically is, we open a flap. So we'll cut the gums, um, flap it, remove the bone that's holding the teeth from here because the gum follows the bone. And then try to make everything look, look nice and symmetric. And then we did veneers on her. So this is her after. So you see how we closed that space. Gum levels are more symmetric. Uh, we brought these teeth out a little more for a fuller smile. She was so happy. I mean, she cried when, he, when she saw her teeth. So this was a good case. Okay, this is another case that I did here in the office. Um, and let's talk over this case a little bit. So this is what we call the midline. So it's the middle of our face. Um, you see her midline is way off supposed to be here, okay? Um, she had veneers done somewhere else. They don't have any anatomy. They look just like chiclets that are stained. She lost one of the veneers here. This is another crown that's discolored. These teeth are pushed in so much. Um, and then when we did her veneers, I kind of brought the midline to the middle of the face, gave her a little more anatomy, um, um, and translucency. What is translucency? If you notice, if you look in the mirror, the very bottoms of your teeth are see-through, okay? So that gives more livelihood to the teeth and a more um, younger, youthful look. We changed, obviously, this crown to something that matched more. We brought these teeth out. That way, both sides of the mouth look symmetric. Okay. What else do I have for you guys? Okay, here you see gray shadowing between the teeth. Most of the time, 
uh, patients don't feel any pain. So in this case, she had no idea that she had cavities in her mouth. Uh, but I, when I did my exam, I was like, you know what? You have some shadowing there. As soon as I opened it up, you see how there is tooth decay right there. And a lot of times when the decay is in enamel, so you know that there are layers to the tooth. Think about it like an m and &M. The hard shell on the outside is the enamel, and then the soft on the inside is the dentin. And then you have the nerve living in the center of the tooth. So um, a lot of times decay in enamel will look white, um, but as soon as you break that and go through, you will see the darkness there. So that was the decay. This is where I cleaned it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you all a secret, not a secret. I don't know how many people are watching us. This kind of filling was the only thing I've ever failed in my life. I failed that filling in dental school. And I remember it every single time I do one of those things. So I had to redo my test on this one. And here they are. They look pretty good. I don't think I would fail this one. So I'm saying you got to learn in dental school because things happen. Okay, this is another case. I love this patient. He's a really well-known doctor here in the medical center. And he's been taking care of patients his whole life. Um, super, super nice guy. And he was ready to take care of his teeth. So you can see a lot of wear on his teeth. Um, oh, I have another picture. You see these black triangles, that's from gum recession. So with age, our gums pull away from our teeth. We had a really old um, bridge right here. And the hard thing with replacing a really old bridge like that is we have no idea what's underneath it. So before I open it up, I tell the patient, listen, even the x-ray will not give me a clear idea on what I am to expect. So um, we can expect anything. You might end up needing root canals. We might end up needing extractions. I really don't know. So it's really important to explain things to the patient before you go in because after you go in, they're going to think you messed it up. But if you give them like, not, don't try to convince a patient to get treatment done without telling them, you know, I mean, things can happen. Things can go south. Okay, then this is his case after. So again, symmetry. So to make his gum level symmetric, you see how high this is? We used pink porcelain. There is an option of gum grafting, but he didn't want to do that. So we used pink porcelain mm. to kind of make these look a little more symmetric. And then to close these spaces, if you, if like I zoom in really well, you can see there's uh, pink porcelain in between the teeth. Um, he was really happy with the results. His wife was really happy and I was happy for them. By the way, this we kept as the old bridge. So I didn't replace this or this side. It was just these teeth and up here. And that's a smiling picture. Okay, this is another case. Um, this case is the nightmare because <laughs> this patient, I really had to establish good oral hygiene with him. Super, super nice guy. But he didn't brush his teeth. After he brushed his teeth, he would eat candy or something in bed before he went to sleep. Um, you'll be surprised because when you ask a patient, do you brush your teeth? They're like, yeah, I brush twice a day. And then you're like, okay, let's talk about your food. Mm, I don't eat a lot. No. What he said was, I have a sweet tooth. I was like, okay, what does that mean? Because I have a sweet tooth, but I don't eat candy all day. And he was like, and he counted the things that he eats for me. And I was like, oh no. I was like, if you want to start this, if you want to fix your teeth, we got to change this. You've got to change what you're drinking. You got to change what you're eating. He invested a lot of money into this, but you also have to invest in changing your habits because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get decay. Um, he ended up losing these two teeth. There was no uh, bone around them. He was interested in um, implants. But unfortunately, he didn't have enough bone for implants, so we had to do a bridge here. He did get a bunch of implants here and there. I do have a periodontist who comes to my office every other Wednesday and places my implants for me. So I don't do the actual surgery, but I do restore. 
uh, the implants. Let's see. And that's him after. Now, it looks much wider, cleaner, a lot nicer. But I will tell you, he got decay on two more teeth after I placed my crowns because he kind of saw them white, got excited, didn't really do what he was supposed to do and got decay. And he knew, like, he didn't blame me or tried to. No, he was like, it's all on me, doc. I'm not doing what you're telling me to do. So these things need maintenance. You cannot promise patients that these, these things are going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. Sorry. I always tell them not even the teeth that God gave us are going to last forever. So we're not, we're not going to do better work than that. Um, so setting expectations is really, really important. Um, and that's all I have for you guys, I think. Oh, yeah, here. Okay, dentistry is a service. And the reason I say that is if you want to be rich, you can be rich in so many different ways. Um, in dentistry, yes, you do good money, but money should not be your goal because it's a lot of work. It is. You have to connect with patients. You have to be able to deliver to patients. You have to have good verbal skills. You have to have thick skin. If a patient comes in mad, you have to know how to manage that. Um, you have to be good with people. It's not just, I, I mean, sometimes I wish it was just walk in, do a filling and walk out. No, you have to explain every single thing to the patient. You have to make a relationship. And that's how patients start referring to you. Like I'll have to see a whole family, for example, or they will refer their friends to you. It's because they make a connection with you on a personal, you, I mean, they don't have you to be your best friends, but you have to make that connection with them. Um, and that's the only way they are willing to spend that much money to get that stuff done. Uh, last but not least, work smart, not hard. Um, I, and I know this is a preference kind of thing, but I, when I was interviewing for a job, I saw so many different offices and I saw how crazy it could be. Some people work from seven to seven on weekends, six days a week, and just, it is stressful. Our job is very physical. Your back will hurt. Your neck will, will hurt. You will need like arm massages and things like that. It's, it is, it's physical. It's tiring. It's exhausting. Um, you're using your brain. You talk so much all day because you're trying to explain things to patients and you're physically trying to do it. So be easy on yourself. Don't be greedy. Don't work a million hours every week. Um, when I had my kids, I uh, cut back to three days a week. I know not everybody has that option, but that is an option out there. Make it work for you. Uh, now I'm back to working full time, but um, doing the three days a week was amazing because I got to spend time with my kids and I also got to keep on doing dentistry. So it's not all or nothing. You can, you can make it work. All right. I think that's what I have. Yes. If you follow me on Instagram, I post a lot of cases. So I'll, I'll post it on my grid, but I also post it on my stories and I'll go over cases and stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Hala. That was a really You're good, welcome. those are really good cases. They're really interesting. That's good. Now we're going to take some questions from our YouTube live stream chat, if that's okay. Yes. Alrighty. So as an international student who moved to the U.S. for school at 18, what advice would you have for international hopeful dental students? Um, so it depends on when you move. I think for me, it was the easiest because I moved when I was younger, so I could um, do the whole undergrad and, and apply to dental schools. I know people who go to, um, who were dentists in their own countries and then moved here, they have to repeat two years of dental school. And I know only um, a certain number of universities accept that. So I honestly, I'm not the best to ask about that part, but if you came younger, then you definitely can do it. Thank you. What else did you do to better your chances other than research? Let me remember 10 years ago. I took my DAT again. So that's why I ended up taking it three times. But honestly, I got the same scores. 
Um, but I tried to communicate. Uh, oh, I kept in touch with the dance school. So when I got waitlisted, I made sure I went there. I met with them. I tried to ask, like, what can I do to make my chances better? And then when I retook my DAT, I made sure that I like communicated with them and tell them told them you know what I took my DAT again I will send you the scores as soon as they're out um don't be shy to ask questions like call the school see who's uh responsible for admission and ask them like what can I do um to to better my chances also have your application ready earlier on because I mean it makes sense when when they see your application, they're like, okay, they seem good, let's, okay, we'll accept them. But then towards the end, they only have a couple of C's, so it has to be really competitive, you know? So have your application ready early. What advice do you have for balancing debt and student loans? As I said, the first thing is take only what you need. I know I had friends who um, they had like, let's say $5,000 left over, whatever, they would go shopping or travel with that money. I don't, I wouldn't do that because I don't want to be paying 6% interest on my trip, you know, just wait until you're making money and do it. Um, so try to take only what you need um, and return the rest. And then, as I said, just live as a student the first couple of years, pay off that money, and then you don't have to worry about it. And I know different people have different approaches, like other people kind of consolidated their um, loan money with if they bought a practice with their practice money and ended up getting a better interest rate or whatever. So it's different for each person. Oh, one thing I forgot to say, I did refinance my money, my loan. Sorry. So I um, while I was paying it off, I refinanced it. So even then, like I had a lower interest rate. During dental school, did you experience any kind of imposter syndrome? And if you did, how did you deal with it? I think people, like we, we doubt, like even now, six years into it, I doubt myself sometimes. And I'm like, ah, did I do this right? Like, why am I here? And I mean, that's always going to happen. Honestly, the truth about dentistry is some days you will think you're the queen or the king of the word, world. You'll give a patient a smile and they're going to be so happy and you're going to be the happiest person. And then other days you're like, Oh crap. Why am I in this? What did I do to myself? So it's a day to day thing, but in dental school, in dental school, I remember some classmates, for example, would go into a new, brand new class, knowing exactly like oh, this professor is mean. They're looking for this, this, and this, they don't like this and this. I had no idea. I went into everything with a fresh slate. Like I didn't know. Um, and I think that helped me so much. Like in waxing class, for example, I got an A on my first one because I wasn't nervous. I was like, oh, we're making teeth out of wax. Okay. I'm like, I'm just playing with it. And my friend was like, oh my gosh, you look at everything. You can't move. You can't. And, and she ended up being just so nervous. And just don't be nervous. Try not to be nervous. What is one thing you wish you knew before getting into dentistry? Mm. I didn't realize how much your verbal skills affect your work. You could be the best clinician in the world, but if you don't know how to talk to patients, you will never be successful. And your work could, and I've seen it firsthand, and your work could be hmm, mediocre, but patients love you and everybody's going to come to you. So verbal skills is really important. But other than that, everything, I knew my back was going to hurt. I knew my neck was going to hurt. I, I kind of knew other stuff like that. So when you do veneers, can you explain the process on choosing a shade? Is there such a thing as too white? There is such a, so shade has a lot of, there's, we look at a chroma and a value and, and color is not just color. There are different layers to it. So when we're picking a shade for a patient, 
um, we, you look at their complexion, okay? You look at the whiteness of their eyes. You look, you ask them, what do you want? You want something natural or do you want a Hollywood bright white smile? So this is kind of, you work with the patient, but also you have to communicate with the lab because they're the ones doing it. So remember when I talked about translucency, a big part of veneers is how they reflect light and how they let light pass through. So the translucency is when the light passes through it um, because it's see-through at that area. So a lot, it's not just color, it's a lot more than that. On that note, where did you learn about veneers? Was it something you taught in dental school or did you do a continuing education course for that? So remember I showed you all that first case with the big space in between. I had mentioned that I did that case in dental school. Uh, not everybody got to do a veneer case in dental school, but I knew that I like cosmetics. So I wanted to learn that. And, um, and that's why I ended up working with a resident. Um, something else about dental school. Residents are really nice. Like when I did oral surgery rotation, for example, um, I, I'm not a lot into blood in these things, but I was there, like I peeked my head through and I wanted to learn. I wanted to see what they do. Uh, same thing with, with prosthodontics. I used to spend time with these residents, just go watch what they're doing um, because they get to do more things than we do. Um, they, they're willing to show you, they're willing to teach you. And, um, and as I said, with the veneers specifically, I worked under Dr. Sheesh, who is a really, really famous, um, cosmetic dentist. And he used to teach residents. So when I did this case with the resident, I get to learn from him as well. So, um, if you have a chance like that in whatever dental school you apply to definitely jump on it. So one of our viewers was wondering how they find a mentor during undergrad. Do you have any recommendations as to how to do that? Mm, in terms of like a dentist mentor or? Uh, they didn't specify, but I'm assuming so. I mean, for me, honestly, what helped me a lot, like my organic chemistry teacher, she provided us with a sheet on like, if you want to apply to professional school, these are the things that you need. And remember, I had mentioned that when I came, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And if it wasn't for her and that sheet of paper, I probably would have been lost. Um, people will help you along the way. I don't know how you're going to get them, but you will find them. And then like your family dentist, for example, reach out to them. Um, I usually will take sh uh, people who want to shadow in my office and I answer all their questions and stuff. Now with COVID, I've only had like two in the past six months or so. So we're a little more cautious about it, but reach out, reach out to people. How many hours do you typically work in a week and how do you balance work and family life? I mentioned that I was working three hours, uh, sorry, three days a week. Um, that was really nice because I had enough time at work and I felt like I had enough time with the kids. By the time it was Sunday night, I couldn't wait to go back to work on Monday. Um, when you have kids, you'll realize that work at home is harder than being at your job. Um, now that I transitioned to four days a week, honestly, it's, it's exhausting. So I am here Monday through Thursday. Um, as I said, our work is physical, like you physically get tired. Um, so I work from, I come to the office at about 7.30 and I leave about 4.35. Um, so it is like full days. Um, but I'm off Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that's really nice because I get to spend the weekends with, with my babies. And you need help, like you have to get like your spouse or significant other needs to be. Um, so my my husband is a uh, physician, so his schedule is even busier than 
mine. But we, when we're at home together, like I'll cook, he'll clean or whatever. Like we split work. You can't do it all. There's no way. How do you think COVID-19 will affect dentistry in the future for the next few years? Um, that's an interesting question. I feel like some people are seeing their teeth more that they're doing Zoom uh, meetings all the time. They're seeing themselves more, so they're paying more attention to their teeth. Um, other people are wearing masks all day, so they're not really looking at their teeth. But dentistry is not just cosmetic things happen. Like you will always have tooth decay. You will always have people eating sugar. You will always. So I don't think we're, I mean, people are going to need us for sure. It's not just cosmetic. It's, it's a, it's a health thing. So. What classes do you recommend students take while they're doing their undergrad to prepare for dental school? Organic, organic chemistry, biochemistry are things that I took that were repetitive in dental school. Um, I didn't take anatomy, but I think it's a good idea to take anatomy and physiology. Mm, because, you know, the first two years are like biochemistry, histology, physiology, anatomy. Um, so, yeah, those are the if you want to take a photography class, if you're interested in cosmetic, that's that's also applicable. We take a lot of pictures. Yeah, one of our viewers said that they're interested in developing silk carving as a good as a good hobby for preparing for dental school. Would you recommend mm -hmm. that? I would be sneezing all day if I was soap carving, but it's great. Yeah, anything with your hands, honestly, because you get to a point where you're trying, your brain is trying to tell your hand to do something. And that connection between the brain and the hand is really important. So I feel like after dental school, I have more control over my hand. Like I can draw stuff and I can apply eyeliner and all these things that you can do with your hands and you just have more control. How do you recommend that pre-dental students get um, opportunities and resume builders for dental school during COVID when everything is kind of shut down and delayed? Yeah, that's hard. I don't know if um, at y'all schools there, I remember we had like a writing lab that used to help us with CVs and stuff. Again, remember, English is not my first language, so I struggled with making my CV. And um, so reach out for help. I think English departments usually will offer. And there are some like CV workshops and stuff that you can do. I'm sure now they're having them online. But I'm not the best person to ask that question. When you're in dental school and you've decided that you have an interest in a certain residency, how do you approach the residents to allow you to shadow them? You just go there and say, hey, listen, I'm interested in this. Is it okay if I hang out? And of course, you're busy all day with classes and stuff. So if you communicate with your professors, like let's say you're interested in root canals, let your root canal professors know that you have an interest in that. Um, and they will help you. They will tell you like when you have time, just come and shadow and usually they're very and you have you will have rotations like as a student you will have rotations in different departments so just you know network with them and tell them that you're interested and they'll I honestly have have had really good experience with residents they've always been helpful and um and I remember I learned a lot from them So someone in the chat said that they shadowed an oral surgeon and he emphasized the importance of being board certified. Is there some kind of board cert certification for general dentists? There is not a board certification for general dentists. That's something for residents. Of course, we're board certified. We took our boards and everything, but um, uh, specialists have an extra board that they have to um, do. Is there a specialty that you considered going into? Prostodontics. You never know, it's not too late. I might go back. 
And what do you like about prosthodontics? So uh, prosthodontics is all the complex cases. So um, I don't know if you remember the case with the guy with the implants. That's a complex case. Um, and with pros, they kind of give you all the complex cases and you get to solve them. I love like full mouth rehabilitations and stuff. Um, they're challenging, but they're very satisfying at the end. And I had to take a lot of CE courses. I feel like if I had taken that residency, I wouldn't, would have like, everything would have been during those two, I think it's three years. It's like those two to three years of um, residency. I had a quick question, Dr. Haylott. So you were, you're talking about the first case that you showed us, it was a project that you did with veneers, but you said not every dental student gets to. So how did you incorporate that into your schedule? Was that like something outside of class? Um, let me try to remember. So a lot of the lab work was, yes, outside of class time. I remember leaving like school at 8 and 9 p.m. some days. So um, a lot of that lab work was out of school, uh, like out of class time. Um, as far as appointments, so you had to convince your patient because they had to pay a little bit extra to move them to the resident clinic. So you had to convince the patient to do it. Um, so that's where your verbal skills kind of work. And, and then um, you have to like um, arrange with the resident and with the patient. So it is a lot, it takes a lot more work, but it was definitely worth it. If you're someone with shaky hands, would that affect your ability to perform well in dental school? Well, you have to find out why do you have shaky hands? Is it something with your thyroid or is there a medical reason for that? Um, I think, yes, you need, you need steady hands, honestly, because you're working. All our, our measurements are in millimeters. This is very precise stuff that we do. Um, and there's not a big margin of error. Like for a crown, let's say you're preparing a crown, you need your margin to be a millimeter all around, let's say. If you do it half a millimeter in one place, then your crown is gonna to be too thin there. So that's an area that might break. So I feel like, yes, you do need steady hands. For students who have a lower GPA, what do you recommend that they do to boost their application? Um, if they don't have a chance of taking extra classes to increase their GPA, um, I would say reach out to the dental school of your interest and they usually have uh, an admissions committee and talk to someone on that committee. Tell them, you know, this is the situation, but I'm really interested. What can I do? Because I know some people went ahead and did like a master's just to increase like a master's in health or something like that. But I don't know if that is necessary. Um, I think it's different from one school to another. So reaching out and asking questions is a good idea. We've heard it in the past that dental schools don't necessarily go too in depth about the business side of dentistry. Could you talk a bit about that and how you were able to learn more about it? Yes. So I'm not great with business. Um, the practice I work at right here, I'm not an owner. Um, this used to be a private practice for like 40 years, and then it got bought by Heartland Dental. Um, clinically, we do everything the way it was done in private practice. So um, the corporation doesn't really tell us what we need to do or dictate procedures that we do or tell us do this and don't do that. You know, we do everything the way it used to be done. Um, I, we're not in network with insurance companies. So I don't know exactly because I, I hear from other like dental friends and stuff, how they have to do things a certain way so that they can get covered by insurance and all of that. Honestly, the reason why I don't have my office right, like my own office right now is because I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with insurance companies. I don't want to deal with payroll. I don't want to deal with staff. 
there's a lot to a dental office, like to be able to run a dental office. It's not just patients and um, dental procedures. You have like a whole 15 people that work here that need food on their table, you know, like you're responsible for so many people. Um, and that can get really stressful. And that's why I don't have my own office. I don't want to deal with that. What was your time commitment in dental school? About how many hours a week did you spend on studying and preparing for cases? Oh, all day, every day. Like that's all I did was dental school. I um, I got married third year of dental school, Christmas break. Um, my husband went back to his residency in Texas. I went back to dental school in Georgia. We had like a long distance relationship. We barely saw each other because I was so busy with school and he was busy with residency. So um, I don't know how some people had kids during dental school. Like I have a different level of respect for them now that I know what it takes to be a mother. Um, so it it is a full time thing. I have a question, Dr. Haylett. What would you say your favorite year of dental school was and then your least favorite year? Favorite year for sure, the last year, uh, because we got to do more cases. We were a little more independent. Um, we got to celebrate our graduation. It, it was a really fun year. I loved fourth year. Worst, I'm trying to see, was it first year or second year? I think first year because it's all like you're stuck in that lecture hall all day from eight to five um and at the time you're still not in the lab very much you're still not in clinics very much so I didn't, that wasn't my favorite when did you first start seeing patients like I know some dentists have said that their dental schools they got to see patients their first year but others had to wait until their third year I think we started seeing patients our second year of course, before that, we practiced on each other, injection, all of that, but um, patience wasn't until second year. Do you have any other questions in the chat, Alexis? Yeah, how do you feel about the rise of corporate dentistry? I think it depends. I don't think all corporate den like dental offices are the same. Um, as I said, when I interviewed, I saw so many different ones and some of them were crazy. You're like in a factory, uh, in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, others, like, I love Heartland. I, um, but of course, you need to remember something. There's a difference when, let's say, Heartland buys an office that was already been functioning for 40 something years versus them building you an office and putting you in it. It's totally different because they get like if they're building you the office, then they have their own rules and things that you have to follow. In my case, this was already established uh, a successful practice, so they don't really get to change much in it, but they do pay for CE courses. Um, so that's nice. Um, and then you again, you don't have to worry a lot about the business. I don't know. Someone in the chat asked, for those who are not artistically inclined, would you recommend orthodontics? I mean, if that's something you're, you have to have an eye for things. So even with ortho, you're moving stuff around, but you want to have the end result in your head before you start moving teeth, right? So you're going to want to know, uh, because a lot of times, for example, let's say the patient has smaller teeth. You have to put them in a position where the restorative dentist can come back and restore it to the proper dimensions. So you have to have an eye for it, but I don't think you have to be artistic. I never considered myself artistic, but then you will learn how to look at cases and how to look at teeth. Alrighty, I think that's all the time that we'll take for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hala, for answering all of our questions. I know there were a lot. <laughs> there were a lot. Thank you, guys. This was fun.
And thank you for your presentation. It was really informative and I loved looking at those cases. The end results were really cool. Oh, and God. I want to thank all our viewers for joining us today. We're going to post our attendance quiz in the YouTube live stream chat and also in our group me and it'll also be in our Instagram bio. So the quiz will remain open for 12 hours for anybody who wasn't able to watch the session live. And I want to thank you all again and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you guys.